Einen schönen guten Abend und herzlich willkommen hier zu, zur letzten Veranstaltung unserer großen Reihe über Agnes Varda. Selbstporträts von anderen, das Universum von Agnes Varda. Zehn Monate lang haben wir uns damit beschäftigen können mit den Filmen von Agnes. Sie selbst war zweimal hier und dass das alles möglich war, dafür möchte ich gerne jetzt an dieser Stelle einfach nochmal unsere Partner nennen, die das möglich gemacht haben. An allererster Stelle natürlich das Institut für Theater, Film und Medienwissenschaft äh, an der Uni Frankfurt und Vincent Hediger und Marc Siegel. Toll, dass ihr all diese Gäste eingeladen habt. Dafür auch schon mal einen Applaus an der Stelle nochmal. Dankeschön. Dann natürlich das Exzellenzcluster Normative Orders der Goethe-Universität, die es möglich gemacht haben, dass wir diese Veranstaltung tatsächlich alle mit freiem Eintritt realisieren konnten. Ja, das Ganze im Rahmen der Hessischen Film- und Medienakademie und in Kooperation mit dem Institut Français, oder wie es jetzt heißt, Institut Franco-Allemand de Sciences Historique et Sociales, sowie dem Masterstudiengang Curatorial Studies der Städelschule und dem Institut für Filmwissenschaft an der Mainzer Gutenberg-Universität. Einen herzlichen Applaus nochmal an alle, die da dabei waren. Vielen Dank. Ja, Sie sehen, eine so große Reihe erfordert viel Arbeit und viel äh, ja, Zuspruch von vielen Seiten. Das war eine sehr, sehr erkenntnisreiche Reihe und sie ist ja noch nicht vorbei. Ähm, wir haben ein ganz großes Highlight heute Abend. Ähm, ich kann Ihnen auch schon mal sagen, Glückwunsch, dass Sie sich gegen den Fußball entschieden haben. <lacht> Jonathan Rosenbaum wird uns gleich die Freude machen, dann über einen der weiteren großen Klassiker von Agnès Varda, saint ouen loire zu sprechen. Marc Siegel wird ihn gleich vorstellen. Wie immer gibt es ein Begleitprogramm in unserer Reihe, äh, auch in diesem letzten Monat Juli jetzt. Ähm, und diesmal widmen wir uns diesem Oberbegriff, der gefunden wurde, diesen Selbstporträts von anderen. Ähm, und zwar sind das jetzt noch in den folgenden Wochen drei Filme, die ich Ihnen gerne vorstellen möchte. Zuallererst am, am Mittwoch, den 13., also nächste Woche, ein sehr selten gezeigter Film über Jean Cocteau, ein Dokumentarfilm von Edgardo Kosarinski. Und zwar heißt der Autoporträt d'un inconnu, also Selbstporträt eines Unbekannten. Und das Besondere ist, dass dieser Film nach dem Tod Cocteaus entstanden ist und er wirkt wie ein Selbstporträt. Ich kann Ihnen das nur ans Herz legen. Ähm, danach zeigen wir noch David Wants to Fly ähm, von David Sieveking, sein Versuch, ein Porträt über David Lynch zu machen. Und es gestaltet sich zu einem Selbstporträt in Kombination mit dem Porträt über Lynch. Und dann zum grünen Abschluss noch ein Klassiker der Black Exploitation Bewegung, Shirley Clark hat ihn gedreht, Portrait of Jason, Jason Holiday ist da zu sehen. Ähm, ich ja, bitte Sie einfach, das nochmal anzuschauen. Draußen gibt es ja wie immer die Flyer dazu. Und ja, wie immer werden wir heute eine wunderbare Kopie sehen, ein DCP von Agnes Wader selbst überarbeitet, Sinita Maris, ein weiterer Partner in dieser Reihe. Ich will gar nicht mehr viel sagen. Bitte begrüßen Sie Marc Siegel und einen schönen Abend. Thank you. I switch to English. I'm already in English. I will stay with English. Um, Jonathan Rosenbaum has been one of the most influential film critics in the United States over the past four decades. He was head film critic for the Chicago Reader for just about 20 years, a little bit more than 20 years, from the late 1980s until 2008. Beyond Chicago, Rosenbaum published and still publishes in such distinguished film and art magazines as Film Comment, Cahier du Cinema, and Art Forum, among others, many others. As his incredibly useful website, jonathanrosenbaum.net, reports, he has published over 9,000 pieces since the late 1960s. And by the way, I should point out a vast selection of these articles are indexed and accessible online on his personal website, which has a great search engine and so is a tremendous resource also. Throughout his career, Rosenbaum has played a key role in American film criticism, partially for his um, interest in drawing attention to non-American films. And I say that um, not to... Um, to uh, turn our attention away from a lot of the work he has done for American film. Um, for instance, um, an early or a book most recently, or somewhat recently on Orson Welles, um, a person, a director who he um, conducted numerous interviews with, a book on Jim Jarmusch's film Dead Man, a co-authored pioneering book on the midnight movie phenomenon, and uh, more recently, 
a book on transgressive American comedies that was published on the occasion of a film series on this topic that he curated for the uh, Viennale uh, in uh, Vienna in 2009. But world cinema and French cinema in particular has remained a steadfast interest of Rosenbaum's. In terms of world cinema, I would just say, aside from his many um, uh, pieces of criticism, he co-authored a book on the recently deceased Iranian director Abbas Kiristami in the early 2000s. Rosenbaum lived in Paris for five years at the end of the 60s, early 70s, and developed personal relationships with a number of filmmakers, many of whom he interviewed for various publications. And just anyone who just Googles Jonathan Rosenbaum finds out what I, who have been reading his work for years, didn't know, um, that he actually was an assistant um, for Jacques Tati um, and appeared in a Robert Bresson film. Um, so he has a, a vast um, uh, um, experience and series of connections with uh, French filmmakers. He published a, a kind of pioneering early um, book of texts and interviews with Jacques Rivette for the British Film Institute in 1977. In a new preface to a Korean translation of Rosenbaum's 2010 book, Goodbye Cinema, Hello Cinephilia, he writes, my habits as a compulsive film goer were essentially formed by growing up as the grandson and son of film exhibitors in northwestern Alabama in the 1940s and 50s, which, with few exceptions, mainly meant growing up on American commercial cinema. But my positions and attitudes as a cinephile were largely formed by the French New Wave specifically by the films and criticism that began to become visible and available in New York shortly before I started college there in 1961. Rosenbaum's personal reflections are fascinating and his reflections on cinema, politics, culture, and growing up in Alabama make up the substance of his first book, an experimental autobiography called Moving Places. My Life in Cinema that was published in 1980 and then republished in 1995. He is that rare kind of film critic whose work is avidly read and praised by cinephiles, academics, and filmmakers. His 1997 book, Movies as Politics, even received a back cover blurb full of praise from Jean-Luc Godard. I think there is a very good film critic in the United States today a successor of James Agee, and that is Jonathan Rosenbaum. We don't have writers like him in France today. He's like André Bazin." End quote. Plain and simple, there aren't writers with his vast viewing experience, insight, and style anywhere. That's why it's such a great pleasure that he's here tonight to close our 10-month series on Agnes Varda and to talk about a film which is on his personal canon of 1,000 favorite films, a list also available on his personal website. Please join me in welcoming Jonathan Rosenbaum. Well, many thanks, Mark, and uh, thanks also to Urs and to Vincennes. And it's really an honor to be here, and it's a particular honor to be invited to speak about my favorite and Agnes Varda film. Um, and at the end of a series that I wish I'd been able to attend. We don't, we don't have a series like this in Chicago, unfortunately. Um, I should say, though, from the outset that I, as a lecturer, I depend very much on my audiences, which is to say, I would like to invite you throughout the lecture that follows to feel free to interrupt me at any point by raising your hand. Because I, I find that if I don't know the audience, I don't know what to say often. And it, it, that I'm, it's much better for the same reason when it, on the few occasions when I've been asked to do audio commentaries on DVDs, I've always asked to be able to do it as a dialogue with someone else. There's only one time I got talked into doing one single-handedly. <coughs> And that was just because I, I couldn't find anybody to, to do it with. But the reason why is, is that I don't like the idea of um, 
a critic sort of like becoming the uh, posing as the expert or the authority. Um, for me, the best role of film criticism is to intervene in a public discussion of cinema, but not to offer the first word or the last word, but to basically come in the middle because the, disc, the public discourse begins before the critic comes along and it continues after the critic leaves. And if the critic has done a good job, then maybe certain avenues have been opened up. Maybe there's been some uh, clarifications maybe more a rigorous analysis in some ways. But in a sense, I think the critic is best, it's really a social function and it's a social way of entering into a discussion that's already taking place. And so that's why I'm inviting you to really help me begin this discussion because I don't feel like I can do it single-handedly, particularly because you've, considering that you've had the benefit, many of you, of attending a 10-month-long retrospective of Agnes Varda's films, which uh, I haven't been able to do. Uh, and I haven't seen all of her films, although I've, I think I've, I'm pretty sure I've seen most of them. Um, but many years apart, and um, I was just saying, to Urs just a little while ago, that in a certain way, it seems to me that um, it's unfortunate that one has to say this, that she kind of came into her own, her own as a kind of major figure in cinema only after the death of her husband, because her role for so much of her career was that of, um, you know, the loyal housefrau almost. I mean, even though she was known to be, and, you know, also called the grandmother, or the godmother of the French New Wave and so on. But there's there's always a tendency, and it still exists in all cultures to a certain extent, of minimizing the role the women play. And it, I mean, I can see that, I can give, cite many examples of this. I think one of the things that's a kind of um, horrible about the political situation in the United States these days is that it's almost illegal to tell the truth about lots of things that you can't say, for example, that Obama is half white and half black. You have to say that he's black, which is denying the identity of his mother. Uh, it's, and you know, there are other things too. I mean, I could cite many other examples, but uh, I was just recently looking at a discovering for the first time this uh, filmmaker named Nico Papatakis because of a, a very a very good uh, DVD box set that's come out in France from Gaumont. And what I learned from that is almost everybody calls him Greek, but in fact he's Ethiopian and his mother was a black mother. He had a black mother. But that is elided too. So it seems to me that there's something that it's that there's a certain kind of ideological shorthand that the media partakes in and promulgates that often is very revealing because of what it what it omits to say and what it leaves out and what it what it confuses the public about and i think that varda was very much regarded i think in a in an unfortunate way as almost like the mascot of the french new wave she was treated almost like a kind of affectionate pet, but not as a major player. Um, in fact, there's even an interesting book, uh, even though I have some quarrels with it by a, um, a woman I'm trying to, whose name I forget right now, but it's about the sexism of the French New Wave, basically, and about uh, which works on different levels. Although I, even though there, there's a kind of paradox, because I remember when I was quarreling with this woman once and said, when she said all the major characters in all of the New Wave films are men, and I said, well, what about Jacques Rivette's Paris Nous Appartiens? She, I said, you know, that, that that's the leading character, a young college girl. And she said, yes, man, elle est moche. <laughs> Which somehow seemed very French to me to say she's ugly. You know, it's like as if that kind of disqualified her. <laughs> And of course, it's also a matter of opinion whether she was ugly or not. But uh, in any case, I think I think Varda has been able to come come into her own because, in a sense, by having a and almost preparing for it by presenting the work of her late husband in new editions and on DVDs and in 
at retrospectives and so on and doing restorations. But one of the things that I wanted to sort of begin with in terms of uh, what I find among the most fascinating qualities she has is a quality, uh, one of the few qualities that I'm aware of that she shares with Jacques Tamy, which is that she's a kind of indefatigable cataloger of her own work, that she has a way of go, of cross-indexing her own work in all kinds of ways, in the same way that he would sort of like bring back characters from one film to the next. Many of her films refer back to earlier films that, that she does. And the way that she goes about this even prepares the viewer as if she were sort of like performing a kind of critical cheat sheet on her own work uh, of basically telling critics even what to look for in her own films, uh, which I find really fascinating. One, one example of the indexing that I find very charming is, uh, I think it was 10 or 15 years after she made uh, La Glaneuse, the, called in English The Gleaners and I, she made a film, I think, called 15 Years Later, or is it uh, 10 Years Later? I'm not sure. Two years later. Two years? It's only what? Two years later. Two, only two years later. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, in any case, when she did that, she had a particular feature on when the two things appeared together on a DVD, whereas in the course of two years later, when a certain character appears on the screen, there's a potato that appears in the upper right-hand corner, winking on and off. And if you, with your remote control, hit the potato, you immediately go to the same person in the original film. <laughs> and and so it's it's literally getting you to cross, to do the cross-indexing yourself of seeing the same character of doing the same character, and that kind of interactive. Uh, Thing is something that you find going on in a lot of her films in very different ways. Um, one thing I want to do is a kind of to partly to set some of the terms of my subsequent discussion of this film is to present you with a, a DVD extra which was really masterminded very clearly by her, which is about two things, I mean it's 12 minutes long and it concerns both the use of music in Vagabond, and the use of dolly shots. And what's really interesting, particularly about the use of the dolly shots, is how they relate to one another, both uh, formally, thematically, and uh, even abstractly. Because you'll, you'll find it, you know, in terms of the way she treats it, that the, these dolly shots, if, if a certain dolly shot, like for example, might end with a phone booth, the next one, which will appear several minutes later in the film, might begin with a phone booth. And I think one of the most interesting things about it is the shifting relationship of the camera to the leading character, Mona. Uh, it's, never, it's never the same relationship in these dolly shots. Sometimes it's accompanying her, sometimes it's preceding her, sometimes it's following her, sometimes it's starting with her and then moving away from her and so on. And it, this, to me, really describes our own shifting relationship to the film in a lot of ways. It's a film that draws us close, takes us further away, that keeps shifting perspectives on us. And in doing so, forces us to reflect on our own relationship to people like Mona and to homeless people in general, which is what she's, real, I think, largely concerned with in this film. So if we could take a look at that now, I think it's, you'll find it quite, quite interesting. Um, and again, I don't remember if she's actually credited, she, if she takes a credit for having directed this, but it seems to me it really all comes from her own brain, I think, uh, as will be evident when you see it. So let's, if, we, if we could take a look at that now, please. Well, I think one of the things that's, um, that's great about this extra for me is that it really, apart from the fact that it's showing Varda's own indexing of her own work at work, it's really allowing us to see, I think, some of the mechanisms of the film as a whole. 
Um, it's in a way, it's almost like a digest of the entire film. But there are significantly what's missing <clears throat> from each of these dolly shots are the various, you could call them witnesses almost, people she meets in her travels who very often after each scene, the scene, you know, there's a cut to these people talking about their reactions to her, sometimes directly to the camera, sometimes to other f friends of theirs. Um, the film has a very intricate time structure too because we get flashbacks, we get... Um, and yet the film never really seems like it's... Uh, even though it has digressions and other characters are sort of take over the film for brief periods of time where you almost feel like that they displace Mona in certain ways. Nonetheless, there's a certain kind of way in which their function, the, char the function of all these various people she meets and their com comments, which are sometimes favorable, sometimes unfavorable, sometimes neutral, um, is really defining us. I mean, this is a film about the homeless, but it's also a film about us in relationship to the homeless. And I think that's what's really important about both of these, all of the dolly shots, <clears throat> but also all of the scenes that showing other people's reactions to her. <clears throat> I think it's important that the way we usually understand film syntax is to think of a shot as being equal to a declarative sentence. But some of the greatest films in the history of cinema proceed differently, in which the syntax of the shot is really that of a question rather than that of a statement. And, and I actually, I want to cite at least a couple of other filmmakers who I think are this is true of. There are many one can cite. Preminger, Otto Preminger is one example. Um, and of course, these examples are different from each other. Uh, the great Iranian filmmaker who just died, Abbas Kuristami, is someone else for whom a sh I think a shot is much more of a question and an exploration than a, a declarative statement or an answer to, que to a question. Um, but I also want to mention Cassavetes, particularly because the greatest single work that I've encountered, apart from Vagabond, about the homeless, is an actual work that I was lucky enough to see by Cassavetes. Not a film, but it was a, a play written and directed by Cassavetes that was possibly his last serious creative work. It was at the very end of his career. I was living in Santa Barbara at the time and I heard about that he was performing this play in Beverly Hills. And I made a special trip of the 100 mile drive, you know, from Santa Barbara to Los Angeles and just barely managed to get a ticket because some, it had sold out and someone didn't show up. So at the last minute, and it was a small theater, it only ran for one or two weeks. And I'll try to describe at least some of the basics of it. Uh, it starred Jenna Rollins as a so-called bag lady, a woman who's homeless, who goes around muttering to herself with a shopping cart, actually. Uh, we don't know, as with Mona, we don't know where she comes from. We don't know where she's going. She's, she's, she's very, it's full of ambiguities. In fact, I often felt while I was watching this play that it was like a, Beck, a, a play by Samuel Beckett almost. Because of things that are unexplained that happen, at one point a younger woman uh, that was played by, uh, <coughs> I can't remember the name of the actress, but a fairly well-known stage actress, um, comes into the scene and says, Mom, you know, calls her my mother. And the General Rollins character acts like, who are you? I've never seen you before. Why are you calling me Mom, you know? And... We don't have any way of knowing whether, in fact, she is her mother or not. Then there's a later scene when suddenly Jenna Rollins appears in an evening gown in a nightclub, whooping it up. And we don't know if this is a flashback, if it's a fantasy, if it's a flash forward. We have no way of knowing to connect it with the other things that go on. But, the, but in, in keeping with the theme of the homeless, during the intermission in the play, 
real homeless people hired by Cassavetes entertain the audience with song, with telling jokes, doing all sorts of things like this. Um, what it seemed to me that was brought home by this play called A Woman of Mystery, uh, which, by the way, I'm, to my regret, has never been published. I don't know why, but it's uh, it has been performed a couple of times, at least once in France, I think, apart from that production. Uh, is it really says that homeless people are people without definition? That the, that the worst thing about or the most difficult thing about homeless people, and to say that without definition, what really that means is without social definition. So part of the issue becomes how do we relate to them? We don't know how to relate to them because we don't know how to define them. And we don't know what our own relationship to them is. And it seems to me that that's a thing that for all the differences between, not just between being a play and being a film, but being very different, you know, kinds of artists, it still seems to me a, co a common concept between Cassavetti's play and Varda's film. And that almost all of her strategies have to do with shifting perspectives of, of putting us in a different position and putting her in a different position. And even the ones that are imposed in terms of like a narrative, like when she mentions in the extra about, you know, going on this pathway to her death is becomes a little artificial because you know she doesn't it's not like she has a particular destination she's going towards or if she does we don't know what it is um she said she said in other interviews varda that she it was very important to her that the character of mona who's based in part on a woman she actually met in the course of her own research into homeless people uh, and one woman in particular who plays a bit part in the, one of the later scenes in the film, uh, that she that basically these are people who she wanted the character of Mona to be not especially sympathetic. She doesn't say thank you to people who do her favors. She doesn't. Um, she she's she's a kind of person who's doesn't follow any of the social graces yes you had a yeah, i have a comment uh, and i couldn't quite follow you when you made a jump from talking about mona and the character of mona because the film is very much about her as a person and um, when you said it's a film about the homeless because i have i don't know i would like to see your point on this because um the other film that you mentioned the cleaners and i it's very much about a topic because he, she interviews so many different people and the approach she takes on this film it's very different and I would say even um, it uh, it becomes less about the topic than about um, Varda herself in The Cleaners and I, but in um, saint Loire, uh, it's so yes. precise about on this one character, the story about this one character that I don't quite make the jump about the homeless. Of course, she's a homeless character, she's a homeless person, but it's... Um, I think the strength from saint Antoine du Loire in a comparison so, uh, to The Cleaners and I is that it's not general, that it's specific. That it's not what? I'm sorry. it's not general, that it's not a general um, um, observation about Gleaners, but a very precise observation about this one character. Well, perhaps, but it's one character who we don't really fully know, and I think that's important. Um, so I think... No, what you're saying seems to, you know, I think certainly that has a certain legitimacy, although I think it's, it might be said of the Cassavetes play that I saw that that was, could have been true of that too, that it wasn't about all the, even though he brought on other homeless people, you know, like to, to perform. But I, I actually think that one of the things, it's funny that this is a film that could, wouldn't look at it different ways. In some ways, when I see it, each time I see the film, I'm reminded almost incongruously of Bresson. And the particularly the reason why I'm reminded of Bresson is this kind of um, the parts of rural France that one sees. And because it's not just, a, it's true, it is largely a portrait of her, but it's also a portrait of the worlds that she moves through. And that the closest thing that we get to a definition of her comes from all the definitions that are given and judgments made of her by people she meets on her on her journey 
and uh, it it does seem to me that there's a certain kind of um, the Bresson is very much concerned with sol very often in many of his greatest works with solitary women, and certainly in Balthazar and Mouchette, which, which are the two that I think that this you know calls to mind the most. I think actually, but of course stylistically it's quite it, it's quite different. But I do think that it's um, it probably wouldn't be wrong to say that I mean certainly Varda would have been aware of someone like Bresson. And there are not many French films that deal with that kind of um, aspect of French life, let's say, or French of... of uh... I don't think that it would be correct to say that she was making a survey of homeless people. But so perhaps I was, perhaps I was you know, mistaken in giving that emphasis. But at the same time, she did do a lot of research in preparing the film which involved learning about a lot of different homeless people. And there are actually also people she met in her travels that turn up in the film telling their own stories. In other words, people playing themselves. Um, there's an old man who basically bonds with another homeless person late in the film and telling his story about he was an orphan and all of this. And, and it was a real person that Varda met who asked to tell his own story, you know, and playing that character. And I think there are a fair number of people in the film, but they're also actors. And one of the things that I think is really interesting, that to me throughout the history of cinema defines part of the cutting edge of films that are the most fruitful and exciting, are films that blur the usual boundaries between fiction and nonfiction. And this is a film, I think, that certainly does that. Um, because it's 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 based on, I mean, not just through the ideas of actors and, I mean, professional actors and unprofessionals, but also through the degree to which some of it is scripted, some of it is, you know, basically using the actors. For example, there's a kind of a hippie who who studied philosophy, you know, who she spends time with, who, you know, has all these goats and. He's a guy playing himself. I mean, he's a guy who who was a person in philosophy who went. So basically, it's as if she, you know, becomes a documentary subject. And of course, she made a lot of documentaries, in which she treats some of the documentary subjects the same way she treats the char some of the characters in this film. So I think that aspect becomes very interesting too. But again, what I think is sort of crucial is that it's also in a very interesting way, a film about us, a film about how do we relate to a person like Mona and how do we not relate to her. Um, and, you know, she throws in all sorts of other things that can deviate from that because the beginning, the, when we're first introduced to her and the very end of her life, they're both given kind of mythological aspects. The beginning, you know, she emerges from the sea. At the end, there's this whole thing about, you know, uh, falling into a wine vat and, you know, being uh, where the wine becomes almost like kind of a blood. So there's a kind of martyrdom. And so there's a whole mythological thing at the beginning and end, which seem, could even seem very rather artificial, even though I guess the, uh, the thing that happens with the wine, it was an actual event that happened in that village. So again, she's combining things that are artificial with things that are actually real and putting them and and the, the relationship between those elements, it seems to me, is shifting all the time in the film. And consequently, I think we're shifting along with her strategies because we're not given one sort of like position with which to view. And I think that's epitomized in those dolly shots because those dolly shots are really, they're, you could say they're linking passage to their transitions, but they're also things that even in the progress of the individual shots, are changing our relationship to what's going on and changing Mona's relationship to what Varda is doing, uh, which I think is also important. Was there, was there any other uh, hand I saw? I wasn't sure I did, if I did. No, not yet, not, at, not at the moment, okay. Um, do it, does anybody have any questions about what I've said thus so far? I have a question. Yeah. 
th this um, this is fun to ask the questions before the film, um, and I, I haven't seen the film, um, but I'm I'm interested in just to hear a little bit more of your. Um, you're talking about how the film you say is sort of more in a sense about us and how we see Mona and you seem to link that to the use of the dolly shot Correct, is that, yes, is that that's true? Right, that's I'd right. like could you talk more about how how you see the dolly shot in particular? Um, thematizing the the spectators position in relation to to the well, character okay well there's a there's a there's a, a big dialectic that's going on in the film is whether we're identifying with mona or whether we're identifying with people who are reacting to mona first of all and which are very different sort of positions and the film is shifting back and forth between those but apart from those two possibilities there are scenes that, you know, there are dollies that begin with, and you don't know where she is or what the, you know, it's just the camera's moving in a certain way. And then she might enter in a lateral way in the shot, like in one case. And then it might follow her for a certain distance and then Lee go past her and leave her. So the whole idea of point of view is being played with constantly. And in other words, who's telling this story? And from whose position is is the story being told? That that's constantly shifting. And so I think we have to readjust to these shifts. Now, one of the things that one could also mention, it seems kind of, in a way, maybe a stretch to compare this film with Orson Welles, but there are a couple of things that, that did bring early Welles to mind. Uh, I mean, actually not me, but other critics have compared the construction of it to Citizen Kane because of all these people talking about this mysterious figure and, you know, like in, in conflict who don't quite understand her or trying to make sense of her, you know, and very much in contradiction with each other often. But then there's also the the method in early in The Magnificent Ambersons, you have the major characters being talked about by the townspeople and they become, you know, like Wells starts narrating it. And of course, Vardis starts narrating this. And then it gets taken over by, almost as if by a kind of chorus of these people, various people commenting on her. Sometimes they come back again later. Sometimes they disappear from the film completely. But all of these voices form, in a way, the film is like a tapestry. But the, it's a tapestry in which we're, almost invited to carve out our own, I don't know, configurations and, and make it a film. Because it does seem to me one could look at this and say, even though it's not exactly what's being offered, that it is a film about the homeless, the homeless situation. Because, I mean, I think she's trying to come to terms with that as a condition, even if it's only with one character. And... And trying to sort of like say how society relates to somebody like that or doesn't relate to somebody like that, both. And then you get into the whole area of digressions, metaphors. There's, all the, there's a lot of material in the film about dying trees, for example. And the very first shot we have are about a couple of trees. And you could see her as being like one of the trees or you could see it maybe not having anything to do with that is just something else that she's interested in that she's putting in the film. Um, the professor, though, who's who's sort of interested in ecology, sort of like becomes at a brief period a major figure. And she has this a period when she, an experience when she almost dies from electric shock or think that she dies. And that introduces the whole idea of death in another character. So it's like a film that's sort of like with all these vectors moving out in all sorts of different directions. And we have a lot of freedom in how much we privilege one over the other. And whether we use them as just a guide back into the question of being about Mona, which I think many of us would do, or if we see Mona as a way of getting, of becoming the thread to depicting a whole sort of uh, slice of French society and uh, across different classes and different kinds of people in, in these parts of France. And that, and that she becomes a catalyst that reveals these things about all these other people. Yes. 
very simple question. What exactly is a dolly shot? A dolly, she also calls it a traveling. It's usually when the camera is mounted on wheels that move on a rail, uh, you know, on rails. And so it's a very smooth mo motion, uh, linear motion. You know, it's like, uh, although I guess you can have, if the tracks are laid that way, circular dollies and things like this. But But the ones that she has are all straight lines of various kinds. So I hope that clar yeah, that clarifies it. It's a, it's a term that's kind of old fashioned dolly, but it's, there's no precise single English term for it. Some people say tracking shots too, which, which refers to the same thing really. But probably they were actually not, probably not shot with a dolly, but with a, with a steady cam. Could be. Uh, yeah. Because you know, with these, irregular surfaces the camera will probably right but in any case i mean it's a lateral tracking shot yeah. yeah and it seems to me that each of those shots is almost like becomes a kind of a blueprint for what narrative is the idea of narrative but you but she's it but through the way the different variations which she's comparing to musical variations you know, like and what's going on in the in the music, it's like she's really defining what the story consists of, of the whole film in a different way, because because again, Mona's relationship to these to what's going on in the shots is very different in each case, and it sometimes the camera leaves her, sometimes it arrives at her, sometimes it comes follows with, with her, sometimes she like punctures or interrupts a movement that's already going on and and it's almost like and you see i think that the camera's role in all of this becomes a little bit stands in for our relationship it's like it's almost as if we're walking somewhere and she's walking somewhere and then for a brief period that we may be crossing paths with her or walking alongside of her or you know, are crossing her path. I mean, it's, it seems to me that all of those are become, in a way, visual metaphors for our social relationship to her and how much her story is part of our story and how, or how much it isn't. It, it seems to me that there's a whole social question that the film is asking, which is translated perfectly into formal terms. And I think that that's what makes it um, such a rich film because it's really, it, and it's posing them all in the form of questions, not in forms of statements. It's almost like, uh, what do we make of this? Is what is almost like what each shot is asking us, I think. I was th thinking back to uh, La Pointe Courte uh, and, and uh, the, the, the use of music in that film, which, as I remember it, uh, sometimes is coupled with tracking shots as well. Uh, but it, in any case, it's always about. I mean, the the, the 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 shots that are accompanied by music, which is also sort of a modernist music uh, in in a similar vein, are always about the relationship of the two main characters to the landscape, to the people uh, living in La Pointe Courte. So they're like distinctly different from the more real near realist uh, parts of that film. So I was just thinking that in, in terms of, I like the idea of Varda indexing her own work. Uh, and I, I was just thinking that, that the dolly shots in, in um, uh, saint toi lillois actually hark back to to La Pointe Courte, which was her very yeah, first film. Yeah, I wish I remembered that film better, although I do know that it's, one thing that's crucial about that, that I, I mean, there's one aspect of Vagabond that I haven't mentioned at all that I think is very important, which is the literary aspect. I mean, this is a Vagabond is a film that's dedicated to uh, Natalie Sarot, and Natalie Sarot is is an is a you know a modernist writer who deals largely in indeterminacy to a large extent, to things that kind of move around subjects rather than zero in on in on, in on them. So it seems to me that uh, there's another extra on the DVD in which she talks with Sarot. And they talk about their mutual interests and to what extent, you know, they sort of like she. Sarot became a big fan of this film, but uh, 
but that, that they feel a lot of a kind of instinctive kinship with each other. It's not one that they analyze as much as she analyzes the dolly shots, you know. But uh, in any case, La Plante Court is was inspired in part by William Faulkner's The Wild Palms, which told two separate stories, sort of, inter, you know, like intercut, basically. And it is really interesting that other people have commented on this, how much Faulkner himself was influenced by films, even though he, he didn't talk about it very much. Although I have come across recently evidence that he was a big fan of... Uh, both Citizen Kane and The Magnificent Ambersons, which is interesting. But I think that there's even a reference in The Wild Palms, by the way, to Eisenstein <laughs> at one point. Uh, when he's referring, he's, he's comparing a landscape to something and, or something like that, to, to Eisenstein. But I think that uh, one of the things that we get in French cinema that we, that's very, that's quite specific is adapting and being inspired by literary modes, but most often the novel. And it seems to me that what this comes from is a very important tradition in French cinema, which is that seeing cinema as literature by another means, and that this goes back to the very earliest, era, in a way, period, or at least, at least to the 20s, and some of the earliest writing about film. But you can even see this tradition maintained in a magazine that uh, I write for, that I like very much in, in France, called Trafic, that was founded by Serge Denet, and which in many ways can be regarded as a literary magazine about cinema. Because, uh, not only because it includes things like poems, but it, it actually doesn't have any illustrations at all, except for one tiny picture on the cover of every issue. And um, and it, it, it every issue has a literary quotation at the beginning, and so on. And it uses forms like letters, and it it seems to me that this is a an important tradition. And in fact, in Godard's uh, two times fifty years of French cinema, you get a whole history of French writing about cinema, which is literally from Diderot to Danet when he gives a little bit of text from each one. And again, it becomes a kind of like uh, a literary history, not just a history of cinema that, he, that he's sort of doing. So I think that that's a very important aspect of French cinematic thought that, uh, that often isn't acknowledged, but, but because you have more, you obviously have more novelists who make films in France than you do in a, anywhere else. I mean, you do have a, a few exceptions to that in the states like Norman Mailer and uh, and so on and Susan Sontag but but not that many not as many as you do in France where you have figures like Duras and I mean it's a long list actually Rogrier uh, and so on yes I think we should yes. take a look for the time oh yes okay watch the film and continue yeah, yeah. okay Maybe we should roll it up after you. Go, go ahead. Okay, okay. Um, I wanted to come back to this idea of um, Vada indexing her films and these extras, and I was thinking about what it means actually to to index and indexicality and in that you're you're pointing at something that then you can specifically locate when you're talking about the index. But I, was, I haven't seen the film, so I don't know, but it sounds like from this clip that you described, it's not exactly an index that she's having here because she's cutting out certain parts. She's cutting out interviews with homeless people and... Um, is that right? So it's not. Yes, yeah, no, no. So, that's just a in terms yeah. of the background. Yeah. I just mean that she has a way of, um, in this extra, of basically going to these shots which are separated from each other in the film, so that one may not even become aware of them as a series or as a as a musical form, and calling attention to it, almost as if she were sort of, in that sense, indexing the dolly shots. And also making, I think, what's interesting about what you're talking about here is, this, yeah, it's not just indexing, but she's kind of making her own little film out of what she's already made out of her film. Right, but um, she she's done yeah. other things like in Cleo from 5 to 7. Mm -hmm. She's offered us a map of a path that yeah. Cleo takes through Paris, and which is another kind of indexing in a way. It's a, it's a certain kind of showing us, for, well, exposing formal patterns that we may not notice but which she was conscious of.
Anyway, I think we're running out of time, so... Uh, but we will have the possibility to talk afterwards, so say uh, thank you very much at this moment to Jonathan Rosenbaum. Yeah. Und wie immer haben wir jetzt noch eine kurze Pause, das heißt so fünf Minuten machen wir jetzt, wir können noch mal ein Getränk sich auch im Café holen oben und dann signalisieren wir durch den Gong, dass es mit dem Film losgeht. Bis gleich. Please welcome again Jonathan Rosenbaum and Mark Siegel. Und für alle, die es interessiert, Deutschland ist leider mit 2 zu 0 ausgeschieden gegen Frankreich. Yeah! Germany has lost against France. I'm sorry? Germany has lost, just to let you know. <laughs> Did Payet okay. get a goal? Two goals, Griezmann. Oh. Sorry about that. <laughs> um. I'm a little tired from all my travels, so um, <laughs> you, you better start. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm left thinking about, I guess, the dolly shots, you know, and trying to think about in what to what I, I'm. I, I, from your from your description and from what I'd heard about the film, I, I somehow expected the dolly shots to be longer, like those sequences to last longer and somehow be more dominant and present. Whereas to me they seem somewhat more like interruptions of um, some commentary moments or interruptions to yeah more commentaries on on a kind of quite complex account fictional account of of this um, vagabond. Well, they are that, but I think one of the the other things that they do, which I find so fascinating is that the narrative in the film the is really like a mosaic and mm -hmm. of course yeah when when we in the uh, dvd extra you're seeing all of the shots you're not seeing part of them so, mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. you're getting it she's she's tr but it's they have a very different effect when you see them from end to end and then when you see yeah. them and i think that I, that's why I thought it was very interesting for her to do that, to call attention to it, because I think that it's um, what's be, what's in a way just as even more complex is the way that um, what defines narrative in the film, because we get we keep getting these very brief segments of people reacting to her in various ways, mm -hmm. but then mm -hmm. sometimes we we get the reaction first and then we get a flashback and so mm -hmm. the whole way in which we're moving back and forward and of course it begins at the end of the story too the, you know because it begins with her finding her body so it just seems like that there's a very interesting way in which there's a notion of a kind of a continuous line and narrative but in fact it's jumping all over the place mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and 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 I think that that's um, I don't know. It's very it's very interesting that of course the and the dolly shots become just part of that. You know, in other words, just part of the moving forward that is the narrative, mm -hmm. um, and and they almost stand for the narrative in a certain mm -hmm. kind of way since it's uh, this notion of. Um, What she's doing involves this constant motion. But I, I think what fascinates me still about the film is all mm -hmm. the things that we don't know. I mean, um, the fact that, in other words, just how, what determines why she moves from one place to another. We, it's very striking that there's a, she doesn't want to leave the Tunisian guy. Mm -hmm. And gets and 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 is very treats him very roughly and unfairly because there's nothing he can do about it, but um, and that gives a kind of um, a different aspect to all of it because it's sort of like um, that she would almost as if she would rather stay somewhere and if not settle down, it may not be in constant motion, and then it becomes mm -hmm. a kind of thing she's condemned to do. Uh, what what I thought was interesting there is it wouldn't if she that that was a, a kind of um, non-romantic couple in yes. a sense. I mean, a, a very um, compassionate 
loving couple, but it wasn't. I mean, Varda, Varda often tells her story of places by focusing on a heterosexual couple. Yeah. Um, and in this case, um, there was that throughout all these different couples, but they were a really interesting kind of um, a, a new form of sociality that wasn't about rom uh, sexual. There, there was an incredible, I don't know, an understanding, a kind of practical way of like being together. He didn't, he didn't, from what we saw, didn't try to to take advantage of her in any way. Right. What does get the feeling, and I don't know this, if the film really spells it out, when you're trying to get a sense of why she opts for the life that she does, mm -hmm. there's some, there seems to be, there is some form, even if it's not fully articulated in her terms, of rebellion and, and protest. And it seems to be that you can almost imagine in terms of her reactions, the sexual abuse has mm -hmm. something to do with it. Like she, um, that she's in a way in flight from that to a, to a certain extent, or what, or associating that with the kind of um, her as a sexual object. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's a current that runs through the film. Yeah, seems as her. But it's also interesting that Varda herself is kind of rebelling against that idea. In the sense that um, she's trying to kind of redefine, because you're right, so many of her other films are about uh, families and couples and all of this. And this is a film that's sort of like really structured around the rejection of that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, it, and it's also interesting that we don't, I mean, we have a few, we obviously have some couples like the. Um, the goat herder and um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. his wife. But for the most part, it seems like that there's an awful lot of people who are solitary in the film, mm -hmm. which is another thing that somehow that reminds me of Bresson. I mean, I think it's so mm -hmm. much of Bresson is about um, lonely individuals and people who mm -hmm. are very isolated. And you get, and, and it seems to me cumulatively, the film does convey that loneliness quite a bit, actually. Yeah, yeah. What also struck me is um, if, like, in this film, uh, like Varda's films, were, Varda's films often seem to be from the films that we've seen in the series, seem to really focus on establishing a place um, or or being really situated in a particular place. If it's um, set or Paris, Paris or um, but but this film, Gleaners, are these travel films through the country. I don't know. Um, I'm trying, I don't know if other films we've seen are also travel films. Well, actually, films I, like I this, suppose uh, Le Gla Le, uh, the Gleaners and I. Yeah, the Gleaners and this this they, one. They, but they almost are like a pair. They belong together. It seems to me, in mm -hmm. some way, because they're they're mm -hmm. both about, you could say, society's rejects in a way, mm -hmm. and and about the idea of rejection, is very is very powerful aspect of both of them. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's a question no, I, right I, here, Vincent's I, comment. I was just going to say that the, like the most horrible character in the film is the bourgeois wife of the of the of, of, of the the planet the the planet Masha Mechel, yeah, 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 right, right. Uh, I mean, she's like spec she, she wants to get that house, and she sort of. Tries oh no! To, oh, the wife of the of the young guy with the glasses. Young guy, the, the yeah. Young guy. And that's the only stable heterosexual couple, but it's also not working for mm -hmm. him certainly not um uh, but i was just um thinking about two other um tracking shots that that i found stunning the one is which is actually from the left to, to right which follows the car and uh and then there's the falling tree just in terms of timing of that shot that's a it's it's a virtuoso <laughs> piece to get that right and, and uh, to, to make that work, but it's a spectacular shot, but it, you, you can't really, it's, it's not totally obvious. And the other one that I found absolutely striking is that sort of a, a back and forth tracking shot, uh, the moment where she has to leave Aswan um, and the camera tracks along with her 
as she gets into the car and tracks back to the red shawl. Um, and I, I like your reading of, of the camera movements as sort of this, the, the, as a, as a, um, a visual correlative to the placelessness of the characters. Um, and I think maybe that is really mm -hmm. a, a key shot in the whole film because that is the person that you would have liked to stay with. And in, and, and he is also the only one who doesn't talk about himself when he talks on camera. Right. It seems, it seems like one other moment of real human complicity, though, comes with her and the old aunt. Uh, yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's such an amazing scene. Yeah. Where they get and she, yeah. by the way, as you many of you know, if you've seen this retrospective, has appeared at least once before in an, in an earlier Varda film, um, where she was actually uh, nude. It's uh, I can't remember the title, but there's... Um, there's an extra on the DVD that about her talking with her and talking about the other film that she did with her as well as this one. Uh, oh, it doesn't. She said, know. she said, I'll do it. I'll work for you again. If I don't have to take off my clothes a second time. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like what Viva said in Lion's Love. I guess it's a theme. Um, yeah. Sorry. There's a comment. Yeah. I think this film is really successful in articulating in cinematic terms with a truly cinematic language an anti-essentialist position on what a human being is or what a woman is especially better than um, I've seen only one other Vada film I don't know w how it was called um, but there were, we had uh, some um, two options uh, were played against each other but here we had only this uh, this slight and always funny critique of the bourgeois idea of what a human being is or what a human being should be or a woman especially and then this uh, this uh, girl named Mona and I think she uh, um, speaks out her own name only once in the film and that's I think something really Bressonian something Bresson has introduced to the cinema to have this um, this uh, empty space in general and here uh, as a character to uh, and uh, we see as in Citizen Kane that she's a um, some kind of screen for um, persons uh, for everyone's uh, individual habits or uh, fears and desires and, and envies and um, but and um, the tracking shots do do the rest for um, um, support this uh, I think uh, very good because uh, it's they seem to be independently travel uh, traveling independently of uh, Mona's character um, and starting and ending with material objects and I think there are I can understand because uh, why this is your favorite Vada film because I was so strongly reminded of Bellatar because we suddenly start to feel the material uh, the materiality of the objects with uh, start to feel it with our with our gaze with our eyes and uh, this seems to be much more important and the person is uh, not. Um, she doesn't have a core. Every, everyone, uh, everything circles around her, as you said, but it's because because she doesn't have one and is only defined by the relationships and sh she has. And she's like uh, one guy said, it's like a forever Jew, someone without an identity who is always a stranger to everyone. Right. Although I suppose one could also see her as a Bressonian character in the sense that. I see his the typical Bressonian character as as a soul in hiding, and there's a certain kind of way you could say that she comes across as a soul in hiding, that she doesn't reveal all of herself to any person. But she has a core, but that it's not accessible to us, or not right, or maybe accessible not even us. accessible to her, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. actually. And and that's what, in a sense, the freedom is of really not. Because that's the whole th reason why I, I, I thought that the whole idea about homelessness is tied to social definition, and she's trying to elude that 
mm-hmm. and, and escape it in a certain way. And consequently, that... Um, and, 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 and of course, what it leads to is the kind of anonymity of her death in a certain way, which... Uh, It's quite a remarkable performance, I think, by Sandra Bonaire. She was, this is only the second or third real film that, I mean, real role that she had in a film. She did some, apparently, walk-ons and a couple of other things. But apart from, it seems like she was discovered by Maurice Piala. And uh, she did two films, at least two films for him, one just before... Um, Vagabond, the one just after. But uh, there's interesting, I mean, she talks about the fact that she was doing, playing the role to a large way instinctively and had, you know, interesting reflections on it afterwards, you know, looking back at it years later. But uh, it's quite, I mean, for someone, because she was only 16 or 17, I think, when she played the part. There's a question. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, going back to the tracking shots, uh, Barla said that she was moving towards her dad uh, while doing these tracking shots, like the character. And I find it interesting that through the whole film, and especially through these tracking shots, uh, Mona is mostly moving from right to left. Well, that is a common idea of going against the progress of a character. And she only goes from left to right when she's going to seek for help or get water or a job. Uh, would you care to comment on that? Um, well, it's an interesting thought, but I don't have a comment of my own. <laughs> the question in the back. This technique in the film of rewind and forward where you see her moving forward mm. but you also see where she's been and that people talk about her after she's left and in the homelessness theme migration's always been about freedom of movement and her character has always been free to move and when she comes into a scene she's welcome by the men who want her body by the woman who want her adventures and her stories by the people that want to use her for work, for cheap labor, and she moves on. And uh, it's interesting to see how, like you say, her life has affected others who have been in her, in her life as she moves on. It's back and forth, rewind, forward, rewind, forward in the film. And the, the lifestyle of the, of the homeless, it's like the gypsy, we, we, Glamorized their movement, uh, the mus- music, the culture of not staying in one place and being rooted and cemented, but moving forward and forward and forward. And in our modern day society, the homeless and the people without a permanent home, they're probably still exploited, but they're, um, we think of them as. They, they don't have roots, they're, they're not tied down. It was a very enjoyable film. And by the way, Deutschland won two to nothing, <laughs> the, the soccer game. And um, uh, oh. oh, they lost? Yeah. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so reverse, re- just like the film, reverse and rewind. <laughs> I mean, what I was reminded well, of, I just I, know, the, I heard out two, two and no, that's right. but I'm glad I came tonight. Uh, <laughs> I was just going to say that it, a literary treatment of homelessness that I find quite memorable are the early novels of Nelson Ogren. Hmm. There's a lot of material, especially his, his first novel, Somebody in Boots, which is largely about somebody, um, you know, Riding, riding the uh, you know the freight cars and trains, and basically um, there it's in a sense of kind of being buffeted about. But of course, during the depression, you do have a whole kind of uh, literature almost of homelessness mm-hmm. and a culture of homelessness. You know, uh, among uh, because a lot of people were without homes then. 
You, may, may I ask a question, Jonathan? Do you you mentioned that that after Jacques Demy died, so like the what ninety two or the very early nineties, that that's when Varda sort of came out of his shadows. Um, did um, what what or did you were you implying that that Varda that or that that people finally started paying attention to Varda after he died, or or do you I think, or maybe no, I also think... just one other thing? Do you also sorry? Do you also do you personally feel that her her films after Var, after Demi died um, became more interesting? I think there's a certain way she became more interesting and more focused. Uh, I, 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 in a funny sort of way, what's interesting that runs throughout her career is this um, ambivalent relationship to things like family and, you know, in relationship mm -hmm. to society. I mean, part of it is playing the game and part of it is being a very, taking a very per perverse relationship to it, which is why, for me, one of her most interesting films, although some people hate it, is Le Bonheur. Um, because, I mean, she's, it, it seems to me that there's a real, it's almost like a kind of um, a poison pen letter to people who sort of, uh, extol these bourgeois fantasies of the good life uh mm. and in terms of all all these ironies but it's but it it does seem to me that um i was thinking both of of her own um development but also of the an audience being ready for her in a certain kind of way i mean i don't think she would have made a film like uh, the beaches of agnes mm -hmm. earlier on it's very much um and and I you know it's interesting that she kind of prepared for this latter phase of her career by making a whole s series of films of different lengths about Demi, or that were uh, specifically related in one way directly or indirectly to him. I mean, um, including having something about AIDS and something about mm -hmm. you know and so on. So, but there's a kind of um, well a kind of a, a very ambivalent and interesting attitude towards sexuality that runs through all of her work. And that's that fairly much is a constant, but it does seem to me that she becomes more transgressive as um, in the latter part of her career. Or was she, the way she's transgressive in the earlier part of her career is almost in a more traditional way. I mean, in other words, it's it's very it's sort of like uh, the earlier f works kind of wear their bohemian credentials on their sleeve, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or even uh, something like *Lion's Love* is mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. Whereas it seems to me she's being more genuinely transgressive in a later film like this, because mm -hmm, she's mm -hmm. she's not just wearing the badge of, um, or the you know of of someone who's trying to rebel. But she's trying to, uh, it's a much more philosophical rebellion, it seems mm -hmm. to me, in the later work. And that's, and that's what gives it the depth that you don't have I, to the same degree in the earlier films. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Yeah, there was a comment here. Kalani. Yeah, um, I, I think what was productive about the film was that um, it undoes this idea of a singular kind of homelessness. So even the word homeless becomes not complex enough in order to describe the various characters that are shown from people who had master's degree in philosophy to immigrants to people like her boyfriend with the chain who seems to choose this life and yet I'm a bit torn by something that the goat farmer set up this dichotomy between wandering and withering yeah. and it seems like a lot of people in the film also work within this dichotomy of you're so free you choose this life or look at you you're smelly and um, poor you and aren't you used by men and things like this and so while the film seems to show this variety of perspectives at some moments and I'm wondering what the the death scene is and i'm wondering these tracking shots with this music that seems to convey this impending kind of doom that it's not doesn't seem like she's wandering freely in those tracking shots it seems like she's withering and so i guess like in bonheur the the final message is of or the final scene is something that shows you know heterosexual couple living a bourgeois life i'm wondering what the ending of this film means for those variety of perspectives that we saw throughout the film right i think this is a i mean one of the bravest things about the film is that it refuses to sort of like 
take a final position of whether she's a tragic figure or an enviable figure. I mean, I think she really wants, she's really, that's why it's a film post as a question, not as an answer, I think. And it, and, and it becomes really, um, do we have to complete the film? That's the, to me, very basic to the idea of it, that she, it's, um, it's a film in which the ellipses and absences are as important as what's there. In a lot of sense, because there and there are ellipses and you know gaps that we have to fill in some fashion, and just in order to follow the film. Sonia Campanini. <laughs> yeah, um, actually, I was uh, thinking about what you said of uh, the fi later film being, in a way, more interesting. But on the other hand, I got, um, during this um, series of films, often the idea that uh, things come back in our work very often. And what you said about the um, s um, link between um, this film and the Gleaner and Gleaners and I, it's very strong in a way, and it, it was like, I mean, uh, in a way, the themes and how uh, she handled these subjects and characters, it's very similar, uh, and in a way it's already here, we can see not just the theme of uh, homelessness or of um, imaginative people, but what I like very much here is that it's a traveling through again the provinces of uh, of France so through these little villages and cities and the people talking um, are kind of uh, yeah probably not actors uh, most of them and just people coming from the villages um, around France. So this is another pattern that I uh, saw in The Greeners and I, and I found it very interesting that in a way the, both these films are constructed on a similar partner, partner, uh, pattern, oh, yeah. Yeah, pattern, <laughs> yeah, and that um, in a way it's like she, uh, or that Varda, uh, often goes back in and like something was already there also in in their first films. Right, I think that's true. The one thing that I, strikes me as particularly a word that's very useful to Vagabond, maybe less so to the Gleaners and I, is drift. It's not just that the character is drifting, the subject of the film is in some ways is drifting too. Mm. Um, that the displacement of which other characters suddenly step forward and take over the film for a while and then leave it is is one of the most interesting aspects of it. Which is again something that already happens uh, in uh, you know, L'Opera Mouffe and also in um, the film about her street. Uh, and Daguerreotype. Yeah, two. and Daguerreotype. Which one? Uh, Daguerreotype. Uh, the, oh, the film, yeah. the documentary about her sweep and L'Opera Mouf, oh, right. the one about Rue Mouftar. Yeah, it's a, it's interesting because, I mean, in a way she comes from documentary, I mean, you know, in terms of the the fictions in a way come, and and to me even the strength of, um, of Cleo uh, is very much a, a strength of someone. At least for me, when I see it, I, I love the uh, the glimpses you get of Paris of that period. Even the place that I lived in Paris, you know, like a, that street, when they go by in a cab, it gives me like such an excitement. Gee, that's where it, what it looked like then, you know. it's you, you really feel like that there's capturing history, whereas the plot is not very interesting in Cleo. At least I think, I think that's the weakness of it, or it's, or it's kind of banal in the, to a certain extent. Yeah. Good evening. I have a question regarding 
the questions that we ask Nouvelle Vague. The more Nouvelle Vague films I see, the more I feel that uh, bourgeois lifestyle or small bourgeois lifestyle or becomes a, is, is, a, is a big issue for these filmmakers. Also, the future of cinema uh, in Jean-Luc Goudard um, and also the gender, the gender issue that is the strongest in Varda. Um, from from our present now, um, what what questions do you think um, we we address mostly in in these Nouvelle Vague films? I mean, from your point of view. Well, I th there is a difference, but I mean, I think what you're saying is interesting because the uh, the conflict between, let's say, bohemian life and bourgeois life is echoed in a way in. It's, I mean, I recently had occasion to write an obituary of, of, of Jacques Rivette when he died. And I sort of felt on reflection that what his all of his films are about are about almost like the tension in the different part, the dialectic between being alone and being part of a group or couple. That, that, that all of his films are about that. And that corresponds because the group often corresponds to um, something bohemian, yet at the same time the couple is the beginning of the, you know, of, of let's say a settled bourgeois existence. Whereas it, it seems to me that there's a kind of, even the issues of madness, you know, which can hover between couples and an individuals, like both in uh, La Fou and Out One, which are possibly his two greatest films, it seems to me. Um, and it's and it's even those correspond to the again the formal methods, whereas I I don't know I think um, obviously in terms of the lifestyles and the impact of a lot of these films had a lot to do with um, with counterculture and and you know in the French version of it and of course one of the things that's so interesting about say Jules et Jim is is you know the idea of kind of like a romantic and social experiment and a you know menage a trois and yet there's a lot of very bourgeois and uh, conventional notions certainly about women about all of these things and in Truffaut's work as a whole there's a very ambivalent feeling because you almost feel like uh, that they're He almost worships the bourgeois ideal in, in a lot of his films. And a yearning of someone who didn't grow up, who didn't have it, you know, basically. But who's, but, uh, and of course, Chabral is all about um, bourgeois com comments about the bourgeoisie from a bourgeois, but who's also uncomfortable in some ways about being a bourgeois. I mean, you know, it's. I think, in a way, the perhaps the only one who really is not um, dealing with those issues as much is Romare. But even his first film is about being homeless and uh, and a bohemian, you know, subculture. But it seems to me that he's not really uh, contesting social norms in the way that the others are. And Varda. Well, I think she's. I think there's an ambivalence there, but you know, she. It seems to me that there is a kind of um, th what she's doing. It seems to me is far, far more radical than Romare. I mean, um, and, and from a social point of view, I mean. Great. Uh, any final questions for this rare, for this guest who is rare in Frankfurt? <laughs> a rare opportunity. I have a, a more simple question, but it's slightly off topic, but I may ask it as it's close to midnight. Uh, Mark, you've mentioned it uh, in the introduction, and uh, as we have the rare opportunity to, to have you here. Um, and to not let you go <laughs> <laughs> to sleep. <laughs> so my simple question is, uh, I was working with Tati, because you've mentioned that that unfinished project, I guess if I remember it right, it was at the beginning of the 70s and it was called Confusion or something like yes, that? Yes, I mean, the, 
really what my job was. It was an ideal job, particularly because I, I, I needed work and I got paid a salary. But I was really just his audience. That was what he wanted. I mean, he needed because his only way of thinking up ideas was to enact them, to get up and perform them while talking about them, playing all the characters, you know, and he needed an audience for that. At one point in the, you know, because I worked for not much more than, it was every day for maybe two weeks or a week and a half or something like that. But and at one point, I was given a treatment of what had already, you know, like had written so far. But I thought because my job was called script consultant that I would involve writing and it, I never did any writing. And, you know, and it's like the closest I came to, you know, was I had a few ideas that I would occasionally throw out, but I don't think any of them took his fancy, you know, especially. It was really just just using me as a sounding board, I guess, which he did with other people, too, uh, one or, at, at different times. So the other one, one or two were also Americans and people relatively young. But... Uh, in terms of there is a public, there was a publication of the treatment such as it was for for confusion, but the greatest sequence that he dreamed of, which I wrote about, is not certainly part of that at all. Which was a sequence he conceived of of having Tati, of having Monsieur Hulot killed off in the first five or ten minutes of the film, uh, because he hated Hulot. He he really wanted only dreamed him up for one film and. He became his meal ticket, and so he would, was quite happy to kill him off if there was a way he could. He was much more interested in being a director than being an actor, I think. So, if, the, if the, Did you have something to add, Vincent? No, I just... I, I'm going to make an announcement at the end. <laughs> oh. Um, okay, well... <laughs> then um, one more question. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> yes, it was. Because uh, now we we watched uh, all these movies uh, from Anya Vada and it's it's really amazing that she succeeded for six decades. Um, I would be interested. What do you think? What's her secret to to be such a successful director in film history? Gee, I don't know. I think it's. <laughs> Uh, I think, you know, having chameleon-like aspects probably helps. But on the other hand, uh, some people say that, you know, the longevity of Woody Allen comes from doing the same thing over and over again, you know, in terms of, you know, making Woody Allen films. So, I, yeah, yeah. Or Fellini, you know, doing the same. So that Fellini is the substance he produces, like salami or, you know, it's like... Um, But there isn't any Varda, and that's what's kind of, you know, like you can't say that there's a substance that's Varda in her films. And it seems to me that that's a reason to go on making films, because it's, um, she's an explorer. And I think it's her curiosity that maybe that keeps her going. Great. Well, thank you so much, Jonathan. Sure. Thank you for being here. And thank you all. Thank you all for coming uh -huh. and coming to a number of the films in this series. Is it still working? Oh yeah. Thank yeah. you all for your um, participation in this series and coming tonight, even though you could have um, stayed at home and watched Germany lose. <laughs> yeah. And the the reason why I grabbed the microphone is that I just wanted to draw your attention to the workshop with Jonathan tomorrow. So if you want to continue the conversation with Jonathan Rosenbaum, but this time about Jonathan Rosenbaum and the work of the film critic, uh, then you should come to the university, uh, E.G. Forben, uh, what's the room number? Uh, 7 7th floor, room 214, from 10 to 12, we'll have a workshop conversation, open dialogue, about the current state of film criticism as seen by Jonathan Rosenbaum. You shouldn't right. miss that. Thanks a lot. Jonathan Rosenbaum again.
Und für Sie alle, wen es noch interessiert, wir machen natürlich weiter mit dieser Lecture Series und im Oktober fängt es dann an mit Ernst Lubitsch. Darauf freuen wir uns sehr. Also, guten Nachhauseweg und bis bald. Bis. No, no, I don't think that's such a... Although I'm a little concerned about...